need foundation for this to ensure that we have very strong grasp on this topic. Please, I want your rapt attention. Acts chapter 9, verse 6. Now, this is the story of Paul as he journeyed towards Damascus to persecute the Christians. The Bible says he had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus Christ said in verse 4, Then he fell to the ground and had a voice saying to him, that's verse 4, Acts chapter 9, verse 4. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5. And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And verse 6, which is my reference point today, says, So he, trembling and astonished, so, so he's, not, he's not hearing the name Jesus for the first time. He's already aware of Jesus. He knew he was going to, he was going to go about persecuting the disciples of Jesus. He's heard them say his name. He's heard them mention his name. But right now, he's hearing Jesus for the first time. He has persecuted the church of Jesus. He's been there when Stephen was torn to death. You know, he has seen a lot of people being in prison for this same person. But for the first time, Paul then saw was hearing Jesus speak to him for the first time. And he says, he trembling and astonished said, look at that, verse 6. Lord, what do you want me to do? So you see, that's the posture. That's the posture every believer should have. Paul, giving his life to Christ, that was his own salvation experience, started with, Lord, what will you want me to do? Now, a lot of us were invited into the kingdom with a perspective that we are coming because the Lord wanted to do something for us. So we came into church because we were looking for a husband. We came into church because we wanted prosperity. We came into church because we needed money. We came into church because we needed a house. We came into church because... We, we, we were so obsessed with what we needed. We wanted a child, a miracle child. We wanted to travel abroad. And so we, we were told that Jesus can help us get a visa. And so we come into church with a perspective of what God was going to do for us. But we see a posture of a believer. The first posture of a believer should not be one of a consumer. Paul says, Lord, what will you have me do? An average believer doesn't think like that. An average believer thinks of what he will gain, what he will benefit. An average believer is thinking about what is, he, he said, what's the need for me? You know, and, and that's, it's okay. I have absolutely no problem with that. It's okay. It's okay. It's a level. It's a level, but that is not the level that God expects us to be as believers. Paul, starting his journey, started with such a question that poses the place that he was a very responsible person. The true measure of growth is not in years. Please write this down. The true measure of growth for a believer is not in the years of him knowing the Lord. There are people who have known the Lord for 10 years. People who have known the Lord for 15 years. There are people who have known the Lord for 20 years. The true measure of growth for a believer, please listen to me carefully, is not how long he has been in church. The true measure of growth is in the weight of responsibility it can bear. The true measure of growth for a believer is not in the years counting, but in the weight of the responsibility it can bear for God. We all were born as children. I mean, you came into the gospel as a child. So the Bible says, as, as, as dear children, we should you know, desire the systemic of the world that we might grow thereby. All of us were born as children, but then we must grow to sonship. Now, the difference between a child and a son in the sense of you know, functionality, not the sense of sex or gender, is in the weight of responsibility. If a baby is hungry, it cries. When a son or a daughter, in the sense of functionality, is hungry, he or she would cook. So it takes responsibility to be a son. And that's why there are a lot of people, even though our children have grown more than some adults, there are people who have become adults from age 10 because at that age, they are beginning to bear responsibility for their lives. As terrible as that is, you know, there's, a there's a particular law against child labor. But there are a lot of children in the, you know, the Second World War, there were children who were out there working after the Second World War, working for the, at the age of 10, at the age of 15, at the age of 12, there are children already out there working. And so it is the weight of responsibility that defines growth, not years. If God is going to look at a child of his, the way he wants to know whether that child has grown or not is not how long that child has been in church. 
is in how weighty are the responsibilities he as God can now commit in the hands of that child. If you're going to ask yourself a question now, how much responsibility can God commit in your hands? There are people who have responsibility for their house. There are people who have responsibility for their streets. Do you know that God has children in streets? Please follow me closely. There are times that God wants to do something in a street and is looking down for a child he can send on an errand on that street. Particularly the story of Paul, this Acts chapter 9 that we read. The Bible said there was a certain disciple whose name was Ananias. A certain disciple in Damascus whose name was Ananias. Now, when God was looking for someone he wanted to send to Paul, he found Ananias and was able to instruct him and say, please, go meet Saul. He's been praying and he has seen in a vision that you are coming to pray for him. Can you imagine that? That God already showed Paul a vision of Ananias coming to pray for him before God even spoke to Ananias about it in the first place. That's to talk about the kind of trust that God had on Ananias. That if I tell Ananias anything, he's going to do it. So he was able to stake his reputation as a God that cannot lie by showing Paul a vision of Ananias coming to pray for him even before instructing Ananias to go do so. And of course, Ananias obeyed and went. And look at Ananias. The Bible calls him a certain disciple. He was not an apostle. He was not a bishop. He was not a pastor. He was not a reverend. Ananias didn't even appear again in scripture again after that. All throughout the scripture, we never heard of him again. He was available. That's to talk of responsibility. So there are people who have responsibility for their family. There are people who have responsibility for their street. There are people who have responsibility for their nation. There are people that God commits nations into their hands. There are people that God commits a, a, a continent. You hear people that have an apostolic assignment to a continent. Renard Bonke was like that. Renard Bonke was sent to Africa. He said it over and over. It's Africa shall be saved. Africa shall be saved. And there was no single missionary that shook the gates of hell and let souls loose out of the bones of darkness like Renard Bonke did. He had 75 million souls to his record. What a life. What a blessing. 75 million souls to one man. That's an apostle to a continent. That's responsibility. There are people who have given their life to Christ far before in a bunkie. Who can't, act, who can't be, you know, God can't even give them one single responsibility because, like I said, growth is measured in the weight of the responsibility that you can bear not in the number of years that you have lived. It takes nature to grow old. It takes intention to grow up. Nobody has to do anything to grow old. Just be eating, you are going to grow old. You don't have to do anything special. I'm older now than I was when I started this broadcast. And I didn't do anything. It's just passage of time to grow old. But it takes intention to grow up. It takes being intentional to grow up. It takes nature to grow old. It takes intention to grow up. Anybody can grow old, but not everybody will grow up. So God needs men in every generation. God needs men in every nation. God is always in search of men. When I mean men, please don't miss, I'm not gender biased, I'm talking men and women. In every time, in every nation. I said one time, many, many years ago, that the scarcity of God's power in any generation is not the scarcity of God's power, but the scarcity of men through whom he can display his power. And if God will find men, he's going to display his power again. Let's open to Psalms chapter 89, verse 20. Psalms chapter 89, verse 20. I brought my smaller Bible today because it's easier for me to turn than this big one. Psalms 89, and somehow it's easier for me to use the Bible than this soft copy. <laughs> I'm not a Gen Z like Jade. <laughs> Jade has had it over again. Okay. Psalm 89 verse 20. Look at that. Psalm 89 verse 20. Please put it on the screen if you have it. Psalm 89 verse 20. Do we have the YouTube link now? Okay. Let's send it. Someone's been asking for it. Psalm 89 verse 20. The Bible says, I have 
found my servant David. I have found my servant David. Look at that. Psalm 89 verse 20. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. I have found. So when God uses the word found, it already precipitates that there was a search. God searched and he found David. There's a David in the house this morning. This evening. A found. So God searches. So God searches. That's, that's amazing. Right now, there's a search engine going on in heaven. God is searching for men he can anoint. He said, I have found David, and then I anointed him. I have found David, and then I anointed him. God doesn't just find, he also rejects. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. When David was being found, Eliab was rejected. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Bible says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. Now, if you look at the word refused in my own Bible here, there's, there's a mark there to show that there's a particular language that was used exactly, not that. So if I'm going to trace it, it says, I have rejected him. So the original Hebrew uses the word rejected. He says, don't look at him. Don't look at his physical appearance. I have rejected him. Now, God says, I have found David and I anointed David. Then he says, about Eliab, I have rejected Eliab. So if you look at the word, like I said, I was going to explain. If you look at the word rejected, you cannot reject what you have not first considered. Now, if God is going to say, I have rejected this, that means at some point, he picked up that thing and was going to consider it for usage. And found it unusable. And so he told Samuel, I have rejected Eliab. For whatever reason, we don't know. But we know that Eliab, at one point, could have been king. But God, without even telling us what Eliab did wrong, said, I have rejected him. So God found David, and God rejected Eliab. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, 2 Chronicles chapter 16, 2 Chronicles, please, Chapter 16, verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. The Bible says, Do you have it? Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. It says, The eyes of the Lord, look at that, runs to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And he says, Whose heart is, you know, is strong towards him. So God's eyes right now in heaven. The Bible says the eyes of God is going to, that's a search engine, going to and fro. In every generation, in every nation, in every family, God is finding one person. I am so humbled to say that God found me in my family. I've said my family story to you guys severally before. My father's family was on that terrible, untimely death course. When people died at the age of 46, at the age of 35. But God found me. How old was I? I was 15 years old. But my age, my, you see, my response, oh God, that's what I said earlier. You see, that our growth is not measured in years. God was able to commit into my hands the assignment of the deliverance of my family, even though I was a 15-year-old boy. Because I was not just able, I was available to take on the assignment. God said his eyes is running to and fro. Right now, there's a next agenda of the kingdom of God on the earth. God has agenda, he has strategies. And we see it play throughout the scriptures from Genesis. We see the prophets come in and go out, come in and go out. Everyone playing a part, everyone playing a role. The same is applicable today in everything that God wants to do on the earth. There's a portion he wants to assign to you. Don't say I'm too young. Don't say that. Don't say I'm not a pastor. I'm just a pastor three years, and I've worked for God for over 10 years. I don't have to be a pastor to work for God. I don't have to be a pastor to offer my service to God. The Bible says that God's eyes is looking to and fro. Now there's a need for a king. Look at what happened in the days of Eli. There was a need for a prophet. And the woman caught up that signal in the spirit and said, Lord, if you give me a sword, I will give you a prophet. 
responsibility. So you see, that's exactly what Saul did. What will you have me do? A whole chunk of us are so obsessed with what God's going to do for us, what's going to be our own. This was a woman who had been looking for a child for only God knows how many years. She has lost the love of her husband. He has followed a strange woman called Penina. And now he's asking for a child and says, Lord, if you give me a child, I will give him right back to you. How many of us can say, God, give me money and I'll give it right back to you. Give me a car and I'll give it right back to you. Give me a house and I'll give it right back to you. Give me anything. And if you give me this thing, I'm going to give it right back. I mean, we ask people, can you give God what he has already given to you? That's a place of stewardship. Stewardship makes you a possessor, not an owner. It says, give me a son and I'll give him. I'm going to talk about this more on Sunday. Stewardship. I'm going to give him right back. So God's eyes is looking. All through the earth, all through the earth, the eyes of God is looking all through the earth. He's looking for men he can use. Like I said, the scarcity of God's power in any family is not because God has no power. It's because he has not found vessels he can use in that family. If he finds vessels he can use, he will use them. If he finds vessels he can use in the city, he will use them. If he finds vessels he can use in the nation, he will use them. Do you know that God has vessels right now in our country, Nigeria? And we are blessed to have them all over the old places. God is using, but God does not pick and choose. In the sense that he doesn't, he doesn't preempt. God actually searches for. He doesn't say in his mind, I can't use this. I can't use this. No, God doesn't do that. God actually searches for vessels he can use. And if he has an agenda, the next thing he's looking for is a vessel he can use for that agenda. Now, the first thing I also want to note here is that the urgency of the agenda would not undermine the need for the prerequisite. The urgency of God's agenda would not make him bypass the need of his examination. Yes, there's a war coming. Yes, there's a battle coming. Yes, there's an impending danger. There's this, there's that, there's that. Yet, God will not rush into battle with a weapon he has not proven. I just hope you got that. God will not rush into a battle with a weapon he has not proven. God will not rush into a battle <laughs> with a weapon he has not proven. A lot of people just want to rush in with God. God, use me, use me, Lord, use me. Father, Lord, use me. If you can use anything, you can use me, use me. And God says, look, I'm not going to start by using you. I'm going to start by proving you. Yeah, and every level you are, every level you are is a testing point for the next level. You see, we mess up a lot because the first thing that we came into in the season of manifestation too early. And because now you have a car, and now you have a house, and now you have some money, now you think you've arrived. And you don't know that this current level of manifestation is a season of preparation for the next level of manifestation. What you have, what you are, what you are doing right now is a preparation and an examination for the qualification for your next level. Let's open the Bible. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14. We're going to read through. Matthew 22, verse 1 to 14. Matthew chapter 22. I'm going to read through the entire verse 1 to verse 14 so that we could get it. Matthew 22, please follow me closely. Remember what I said, that the urgency of the assignment will not undermine the need for the examination. Matthew 22, verse 1 to 14. The Bible says, now, okay, that's 21, I beg your pardon. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, look at that, verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain man who arranged a marriage for his son. Verse 3, and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Hmm. All right, let me continue. They were not willing to come. Verse 4, again he sent out other servants, saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready come to the wedding so you see there's a general call 
God is calling everyone, come, all you that are thirsty. Come, everyone, there's a call, there's a call, there's an entire call. I was called, you know, everyone, everyone in this building, in this room right now, has a calling on their lives. Every single person, whether you accept it or not, there's a calling of God on your life. So there's a general call. Where you're listening to me from, you may not feel like it, you may not feel goose pimples, but there's a call of God on your life. There's a call of God, it could be to your family, it could be to your community, it could be to a certain category of people. It could be homeless kids, it could be, um, you know, abused children. There's a call of God on your life, whether you accept it or not. So it says, call, everything is ready. Come to the wedding, verse 5. But they made light of it and went their own ways. One to his own farm, another to his business. So if you look at this, these are the same reasons for which people are not available to be used of God today. Some of them say, because I'm busy at work. I mean, I've seen people say, I'm busy at work. I cannot be useful to God. Now, there's nothing you are doing or that you have that God did not bless you with in the first place. I've seen people who shun, you know, meetings in church, you know, shun Sunday services, shun time, you know, in church, shun, you know, opportunities to serve because now they have gotten so busy. Some of them were even, you know, praying. This particular business that they now have was given to them by God. It was when they stayed on the neck of God and they shouted and cried for nights that God opened this door for them. And now they have gotten that business. Now this same business that was an answered prayer to them is the same reason why they can no longer be useful to God. Some people, it's marriage. There are young sisters, you know, single brothers and single sisters who had shouted and prayed and believed God for a spouse, and now they are married. And I say, Pastor, I, you know, I cannot come. You know, I'm married now. You know, I cannot come now. You know, I have all these kids now. And so they are no longer available because God has answered their prayers. He says, look, I can come because of my business. I love this word business because it's very relatable today. I know many people who have cut down on their commitment to God's work because of the success of their businesses. I know a lot of people who used to be firebrand, vibrant believers, who used to have time for prayers, for Bible study, apart from church, for even personal communion with God, who used to have amazing time for their, for their quiet time, now cannot even spend 10 minutes with God in personal prayer. Because they have some form of board meetings to attend to, some form of board resolutions to attend to, and now business has blossomed. They are in Cote d'Ivoire, they are in Cameroon, they are in Kenya. Clients are calling from everywhere. And so because of that, they don't have time again for God. The Bible says, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed some of them. Verse 7, but when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies destroyed those murderers and burnt up their cities. Verse 8, then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited are not worthy. The invited are not worthy. So what should we do? He said, therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you can find, invite them to the wedding. So he says, go out on the streets. Go out on the streets. Even those that don't qualify, call everybody in. Bring everybody out. So you see, if you look at this, you can juxtapose the Israelites and the Gentiles. We are Gentiles, we are not Israelites by birth. We are Israelites by covenant with Jesus. He says, go out, call every other person. These people that are invited are not ready. This person that I invited is not ready, they're not ready, they're not worthy. He said, those that are invited to the wedding are not worthy. Go out and call every other person. Verse 10, so the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they could find, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. So they went out on the highway. They went there and they gathered a crowd of people. The Bible says both bad and good. I'm going somewhere with this scripture. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man. Please pay very close attention to this. Now remember that it was the king that said, go out and call everybody you could find. Yet the king said, when he found that man, he saw a man there who was not having a wedding garment. The man also came in with every other person, but sat in the wedding without a proper garment, without a proper dressing for the garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Verse 13, then the king said to the servant, bind him hands and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, four. Many are called, but few are chosen. So you see, you understand the context of that word. Now, when it says many are called, the fact that there's an urgent need in the kingdom does not mean the prerequisite will be undermined. 
The fact that God has need of men and it's urgent. We need men now. People should come in. Everybody come in does not mean that the proving process, the pruning process of God and what he wants to look out for in his vessel will be taken away. There will be no time that the move of God will be on sales. The move of God, the power of God on every man in every generation will never be on sales. It will cost as much as it has ever costed. God will not go to a battle with a weapon he has not proved. When David was going to face Goliath in the book of 1 Samuel, he came in and faced Goliath. If you look at it very carefully, the Bible says that Saul, Saul gave him his own garment in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38 to 40. 1 Samuel 17, verse 38 to 40. Saul gave David a garment. And you can imagine what the garment of Saul looked like. David was going to face Goliath, a giant who was also, you know, thoroughly dressed with, you know, armors and all that, with chains and with, with, um, with, uh, with, with, the uh, Bible calls them bronze and brass and heavy, heavy materials, you know, that you expect to see on a warrior to, to, to ensure that he's not able to, you know, I mean, his spear or sword doesn't find entrance into his body easily. And then Saul had a special armor. Saul was the king of Israel. He had his own special armor, and everyone would have desired that, oh, wow. A lot of soldiers would say, oh, oh, God, I wish I could fight with the armor of Saul. I could believe very strongly that Saul's sword would have been the best in the whole of Israel. His, his helmet would have been the best in the entire land. His, uh, his breastplates. I mean, because the king has to be heavily guarded. The king has to be heavily guarded. Look at it, 1 Samuel chapter 17, 38 to 40. The king had to be, we have to ensure that even if everyone's armor was, was weak, the king's armor must be of the best materials. 1 Samuel chapter 17, I beg your pardon, 17 verse 38, 1 Samuel 17. Let's open it very quickly. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38, all right. That's it. Verse Samuel 17, verse 38. So Samuel, so Saul, are you there? So Saul clothed David with his armor. And he put a bronze element. So that was, that's what I was saying. A bronze element on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. Who has, who has NLT for this? First Samuel 17, verse 38. NLT. Who can help me with NLT in the house? First Samuel. 17. NLT verse. So Saul gave David his own armor, yes? It broke. Is that NLT? Now I need, I need something that explains that mail. Give me contemporary English version. Contemporary English version. CV. CV. Contemporary English version or, um, or, or good news. Saul had his own military clothes, yes? An armor put on David. He gave the bronze element, yes. That's verse 39. So they didn't explain what I mean. So, but what a coat of mail is looks like the entire armor. Like it wears like a garment. Very heavy. Now, this is the best armor in all of Israel. And so God is not looking for the best men. God is looking for men he has proven. You see, there are men who have better eloquence you could talk better and finer men with the nicest speech voice but the poorest and most shallow spirit there are men who can speak eloquently and the strength of their communication skill is so perfect that they could communicate and they could move you to cry you see the fact that somebody preached and you cry doesn't mean he's anointed there are people who know how, they know how to speak they are the best men god is not looking for the finest of all men david was not tall i would say he was rudy it was airy. It didn't look, I mean, when, when, when Samuel saw Elia, Samuel had, had been in this for, for a while. When he saw Elia, he saw the appearance of a king. He saw the demeanor. You know, when, when Elia came out, the way Elia greeted him, a prophet Samuel, good evening. He saw the decorum. He saw the, the voice speech. He saw the confidence and the audacity. He saw all that a king is supposed to have. But God is not in search of the finest man. He's in search of proven man. So they gave it to Saul. He gave it to David. The Bible says he couldn't walk. Give it to me. Verse 39. Can I write this version? Verse 39. First Samuel 17. Who's reading for me? 
he did David struck on his sword. Yes. And, yes. But he was not used to wearing this. So if you look at that language that they said, the language used is not that they didn't say the weapon is not good. What did they say happened? He was not used to it. God does not use what he's not used to. He was not familiar with it. There's a lot of familiarity that is needed in this thing. You see, God does not call people from a distance. He calls people. If God goes to look for people to call, he will call people in his environment. People who appear before him every morning. God will use materials he is used to. The Bible didn't say the armor was bad. It didn't say the armor was poor. The disqualification of that armor, as elegant as it was, is that the person who wanted to use it was not used to it. And so there are believers with braggadocious voices, but God is not used to them. There are believers with strong tongues. If they lead prayer in church, every tongue, but God is not used to them. They don't have a personal work with him. You know, I said in church one day, the God told me, God said, son, if the only time you come to me is because you have a message to preach or a sermon to preach, and so you come, the only time I see you in my presence is that you come to gather information about me, to go and preach about me. He said, that's not preaching, that's backbiting. You don't know me, I don't know you. We don't know each other. You are talking about me behind, my, behind me. That's gossiping. How dare you talk about a God you don't have a relationship with? How dare you go out there and talk about a God who doesn't even talk to you? How dare you talk about a God you have not talked to or you don't talk to? So God says, I'm not used to this. That was the only disqualification as powerful as that armor was, as expensive as it was, as enviable as it was. God said, hey, hey, me, I am not used to this. God does not use the finest men. He used the proven men. Men, he has proven. So what did David do? Give me the next verse. You can't call it out, David. You are David. So what did David do? David, David said, I can't move with all this stuff on. I can't move with all this stuff on. I'm not just used to it. David took off the armor. He took off the armor and picked up, and picked up a shepherd's stick. In place of an arm and did what? So if you look at it very carefully, he went out to a stream. Bible says in King James that he chose five smooth stones. This was not the first time that David was using stones in the world. I mean, used it against, used it against, um, against bear. He must have used it against the lion. He must have used it, you know, severally. And so for the first time, he was going to face a Goliath, even though he was going to face and harm a. a, a a, a, an enemy that he hadn't faced before, yet he wasn't going to try with an unfamiliar weapon. So he went and picked five smooth stones and did what with it? What did he do with it? Why are you getting out of the page? Eh? You're trying to jot. Okay. He went out to the stream and picked up five mm. and put Okay, so you see, I, I'm, I'm going to round up. I have just about how many minutes more? About seven minutes more. I'm going to say something very, very critical here. And I want you to please pay attention to me. When God chooses us, he doesn't choose us first to expose us. He chooses us to hide us. Until God has advanced towards his enemy, he may not even expose his weapon. God. Until God has gotten close enough to his adversary, he may not even unveil his weapons. And so you see David with a shepherd's stick and you don't know he has stones in his bag. So you can undermine what God has capacity to do because of what he has in his hands. A lot of us are chosen of God, and the first thing we want him, we want him to choose and put us right on the stage. We want him to choose you and put you right on the, before, before a crowd. You want him to choose you, and be, the next thing you want to see is that you want to be in front of the audience. No! Sometimes he chooses you first to hide you. Isaiah 49 says, He has made my tongue like a sharp sword. He has made me like a sharp arrow, and in his quiver has he hidden me. 
Sometimes what God wants to do with our lives is not immediate. So David went for stones. You know, all through our scriptures, human beings are compared to stones. The Bible calls us lively stones, First Peter. It says it shall make us like stones, lively stones unto our maker. If I just say that if these people kept quiet, it says stones will cry out. You know that scripture? It says this people should keep short, this man should keep short. So we understand the place of stones, and there's a lot of, you know, in fact, God spoke to Peter. He says, you are a rock. And there's a between a stone and a brick. A stone and a brick. There's a between a stone and a brick. God said him, God, Exodus 20. He said, don't build my altars with a brick, with cheap bricks. He said, build them with stones, because stones are natural. Stones are original. Stones are not artificial. Bricks are. Bricks have been chipped off. So they have chipped you off. You talk too much. They shipped you off. You, you, you do this too much. You, you need to get this done. So they've chipped every originality of God in you has been chipped off and you are now a brick. So God prefers you stone the way you are. He picked up a stone. He calls them smooth stones. Why are those stones smooth? Do you know why they were smooth? They are still in the water. Why did they pick a stone? Why did they pick stones from the water? Oh, stay in the water. It causes the washing of water by the word. So right there on that stone, every lust is washed away. Jealousy washed away. Envy washed away. Carnality. The stones have been right there under the stream of the water of God's word. And they have been washed and was so washed, they have become smooth enough to be used against the enemy. When God looks down, as urgent as his assignment is, he will not rush into war with a weapon he has not proven. So Goliath was there. There's an emergency. There's an emergency. An emergency. There's no such thing as an emergency. Too emergency enough for God to take his time to prove his servant. When Gideon was filled with, 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 with Midian army, ten, hundreds and tens of thousands of armies were faced against Gideon. He blew a trumpet. So he left. God says, look, 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 I'm not in a rush to do this. You know, I, I don't, I'm not out of time. He said, I'm going to test these guys. The army is out there, raging, turning the wall, hitting their spears on the ground, coming towards, the, coming towards Israel. And God says, okay, okay, okay. And let them go and drink water. Let them, ah, what are you talking about? We have an enemy outside our city gates. They are drinking water. God says, no, I'm not in a rush. God is not so much in a rush, so much he can't take his time to prove his servant. What is God looking for in a vessel? What is God looking for in a vessel? So I've made my point first. The urgency of the assignment will not undermine the place of being proven. And God will not use. In John chapter 7 verse 5, he said to them, he said, go to the water. So again, we see Jesus going to the water to be baptized. Again, we see God testing Gideon's army with water. Again, we see David going to the water to pick the stone. So we see that there's something about staying under God's word and being worked on that qualifies a man to be used on the day of emergency. There is no such thing as an emergency, so emergency that God will not take time to prove. Let me even tell you the truth. Let me tell you the truth. God will reveal his, his hidden weapons. What you call an emergency, God has been working on them. He's never left stranded. In this generation, God is not stranded. If it's time now, he will call out his weapons. And the fact that he has, he's, hiding, he's hiding them is not because he can't use them yet. He's hiding them for a purpose. Are you ready to be hidden? Are you ready to be chosen yet hidden? Why did God choose David? So David was chosen, anointed with oil, and yet went back to the, went back to the wilderness to watch over the sheep. <laughs> That's powerful. That's powerful. That's very powerful. Some people can never go back to the sheep after they've been anointed. You are, I mean, Samuel, the same prophet that anointed Saul, the king, came and told me to my ears that I'm the next king. And you people are saying that I should be going to watch over God. It's as if you don't know my, you people don't respect me. No wonder a prophet is with that honor in his own house. How will you people honor me? When... <laughs> Well, you, you, you Bible says a mass, a mass enemies will be members of his household. But David went back to watch over the sheep, and he was using the oil over his life to cater for sheep. Can you use the oil over your life to wash clothes? Can you be eating? Can you wait for God to advance towards the enemy before he unveils you? 
or you are right out there wanting to be on the spotlight. I said it once that if you start a fire and you expose it so early, the wind will kill it. But if you protect your fire, allow it to go to maturity, the wind that would have killed it will spread it. What would have killed you at your infant stage will be the real turbo engine behind your fame if you allow your fire to mature. Are you willing to be hidden? Are you willing to be hidden? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word that always comes to us in power and in might and comes to us to charge us, to strengthen us, to unveil your plan towards us, to unveil your plans to us. And today again, we've eaten of your word. It's short, very short, but we know that you said you do a quick walk. I ask that for everyone who's heard me tonight that you begin to walk in their heart from this night. You begin to walk that begins to pull them in into a place of communion with you. Pull them into a place of consecration. A place of being proven and being tested. A place where they can become useful and usable men and women in your hands. I ask Lord that you start a revival in our hearts. A revival that draws us to the place of prayer. Draws our knees to the place of consecration. I ask Lord God Almighty that for everybody who's under the sound of my voice today, a work is starting in their heart. And there will indeed be men and women that will be used for your glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. My time is up. It's time for us to take our offerings. I'm going to continue the sermon on Sunday. You already can know how Sunday is going to be like, you know, by the introduction. But it's going to be a short service because we're starting our workers' program, development program made after service. But if you are in the city of Abuja and this season, let me tell you what's going to happen this season. Let me just give you a hint about what's going to happen this season. This season is going to be, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to keep growing intense into next month. Next month, our team for next month is the Holy Ghost. It's going to grow into the Holy Ghost month. In the Holy Ghost month, we're going to have 28 days with the Holy Spirit. 28 days daily mentoring program with the Holy Spirit in the month of November, and in December, we're going to be having the wind of the Spirit. So this month is going to take us on from this day right into it. You cannot lose momentum. If I were you, I would join in with all my heart. This could be the season of revival in your heart that you have been waiting and praying to God for. So you don't want to miss out on this. Please make sure every single thing that comes into this month, into next month, into next two months, follows you strongly as God begins to start a work in your heart. Let's take our offerings tonight and our tithes. If you have your offering and your tithes and you want to make, you want to pay in your offering and your tithes tonight, you want to say, Lord, this is my offering. I've been blessed by your word. I'm going to bless you right back. Because like I said earlier, there's nothing that you have that God didn't give to you in the first place. Father, Lord, I pray for everyone who's given an offering, who's sending a transfer an offering. Lord, right now, I ask, Lord, that you bless the works of their hands in the name of Jesus. That these offerings that they have given, you are receiving from them and it will return back to them in multiple folds, both ways that money can and money cannot buy. I declare, therefore, that you are not stranded. You will take money out of money. Your hands will not lack abundance. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. And God, we said a big amen. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. I believe and I know that you were blessed by that short word, as short as it is. But um, I promise you, it's going to get more intense and intense as the month goes by. Thank you. Do have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.